How to find a good lawyer? How not to sign a bad deal? Is the record deal with major labels fair? What does a top music lawyer think about Kanye's war at majors? And does an artist need a lawyer every time he signs something? Answers to that questions and many many more you will hear in that podcast. My name is George A.K. DMC Style, a multi-platinum awarded artist, songwriter and music producer and I welcome you in this vlog and podcast Music Business in Details for every new and upcoming artist to gain more knowledge and to make less mistakes. Today we're discussing legal rights, contracts and deals with a music lawyer. Before we start, I would really appreciate if you like this video, subscribe and hit the bell button. It really helps the video to rank better on YouTube and it also engages me to make better content for you. You did it! Now welcome on this new episode of Music Business in Details. In the beginning of every podcast, I want to say that I'm truly sorry for my English because English is not my native language. So sometimes I can say grammarly wrong things or forget some words, but I'll really try to do my best. I've so been today's... more than 10 times and I think you're one of the best English speakers that, um, that I've encountered, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So today's guest is an amazing person. He has over 30 years of experience across the entire spectrum of the music industry. This includes nearly a decade as an A&R at, at, for the Universal Umbrella of Labels, 15 years as a presenter of BBC Radio 1, over 150 record releases and remixes in his own capacity as a recording artist, plus a 30-year career as one of the Britain's best-known globally traveling DJs with over five thousand gigs under his belt plus extensive experience as an event promoter and artist manager in their highest level suffice to say he knows the music industry inside out and his clients we got him as a trusted advisor for whom no legal or business affairs challenge or uh, or problem is too large or small since 2012 he is also uh, a specialist music and entertainment lawyer practicing at Sound Advice uh, in London, Taliyot Creative Hub. He's spoken on many panels and seminars, including ADE, Brighton Music Conference and AIM events. He has been a guest speaker on legal issues in a number of and offline uh, media outlets, including BBC Radio 5 Live, The Sun, The Times and a Mix Mac. And I think this person knows everything about music business. Meet Jules Oriordan. Hi, Jules. How are you? Thank you for inviting. Yeah. yeah, this like this bio is just absolutely stunning. This this is like the incredible experience. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot in my time. I, I started in the music industry when I was very young, when I was sixteen. So, um, and I, I almost want to lie about my age, but I don't have to. But I've been doing it well over thirty years in very yeah. different guises. Yeah. So that's actually my first question. How did you start working in music business? Um, it's a bit strange considering I'm a lawyer now, but I used to be a promoter of illegal raves, believe it or not, um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, at the time, they were a lot less illegal than they now are. So actually, they were. Um, I was never breaking huge laws, whereas the laws got a lot more extreme uh, against illegal raves. And that's one of the reasons I stopped doing them, actually. Um, and then my DJ career built out of that. I got onto pirate radio. Um, started making records. Um, was on two. I was on a the station Kiss FM in London as a radio station. Then I went to Radio One for fifteen years. Started promoting events. Started releasing records. Released a bunch of records both under my own name. Started producing other artists as well. Um, promoted in Ibiza, my own branded club night. Was the longest standing DJ residency in Ibiza of any DJ. Um, so um, yeah, that that was kind of my. Um, that's that's a, a potted bit of my history um, outside of being a lawyer. Um, always wanted to, always knew that um, I actually studied law at LSE, London School of Economics, when I was um, t 18 to 21. Didn't initially use my law degree. Um, always, knew, always knew I'd come back to it at some stage because, I mean, I've had an amazing life. I've toured the world. I've been to Russia, for example, at least 10 times, if not more. Been to the, you know, I mean, the numbers are kind of crazy. Been to the US touring 50 times, been to Australia 30 times. So I've kind of done all of that stuff. But it wasn't, um, in the end, as amazing as it is, it's not a sustainable lifestyle um, 
to keep doing that 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 degree of traveling and that degree of touring so i always so around sort of 10 to 15 years ago i, I retrained to be a lawyer because by that time my my law degree was a little bit old and i needed to refresh myself of all things academic did it again got a second law degree at the time whilst i was still traveling on tour and then sort of slowly started building joined a lot a very leading law firm started building my legal career um realized that Thankfully, I'd made the right decision because it's a significant investment of time wanting to be a lawyer and wanting to go about a career change. Meanwhile, still DJing. I still DJ at weekends, not at the moment because of COVID, but I would generally speaking be, still be doing quite a lot of DJ gigs at weekends. So I, so I lead this double life of being a DJ during the week, at weekends that is, you know, in the current climate, but mainly doing UK gigs, not doing overseas gigs, but then having an increasingly large roster of, um, of clients in my legal practice who are probably in three categories are basically in pop, sort of urban music and dance. Those are the three areas that I um, have a lot of artist clients. I've got many, many of them. And then I do a lot of other stuff. I've got some people who are labels, some people who are managers, some people who are um, just different businesses within music, maybe people sync agencies. Um, and my very, very long, the irony is that I spent very, very long hours away and touring in my, during my touring artistic lifestyle. I now just spend very, very long hours at, in my office working sort of hard but you know it's fun I love it and I, and I feel almost like I'm giving something back to um, the artists I represent I never overcharge I, I'm, I'm accessible to people if my clients want to pick the phone up to me I answer it I'm, I don't turn on a clock and start you know do what lawyers are famous for doing and start charging people of course I run a business I make money out of it but I'm sensible with it at the same time um, and it's worked very well uh, and I think my experience Sorry about that noise in the background. Hopefully that's not. Um, I think my experience um, has helped me a great deal because I've done so many things within the music business and they've all been done at a high level. They've not been done at a, a kind of, um, if you like, an amateur level. I hope that noise stops. Okay, awesome. So uh, the reason that you decided to become a music lawyer after so many years of doing more artistic jobs and promotion and and artist management uh, was the you you wanted to settle down I wanted a more stable lifestyle but I also I mean I think that I'd experienced you know the music business has got some great people but it's also got some sharks and I'd experienced the best and worst of the of the business um, signed some really good deals uh, made some okay money but also signed some quite bad deals as well where I arguably was poorly advised had occasionally quite poor treatment uh, in my dealings with lawyers. I wouldn't say they didn't do the job properly, but they were slow, expensive, unresponsive. Um, so for me, there is a, a big part of what I'm doing now is, if you like, uh, making sure that other people don't make the same mistakes I do. But, but looking at it from a, not from a purely business perspective, because uh, I understand the contracts back to front and I understand the art of negotiation because I've been around a long time and, 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 and being a hustler and being a negotiator is a very important part of the job. But I think having an understanding of the psychology of every successful artist, um, having been one myself, is what makes me completely different from any other lawyer that's out there. Because um, as as an as a, you know to 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 boil down that psychology into a few easily consumable sentences, ultimately you are you've got to have really incredibly thick skin and an incredible determination at the expense almost of everything else around you to succeed in order to be to be particularly successful. And I'm sure that those those um, attributes probably would apply in certain other aspects of uh, professional life as well. Uh, and understanding that and understanding the way that artists work and understanding how that impacts on the on the relationship between artists and the people around them, such as managers, record labels, um, and and almost understanding yeah, having having a sort of second sense idea about um, those artists that are really going to be super successful because you can kind of see it in them. You can see they've got that. So sometimes talent is not enough. And I think that applies, to, you know, in my time, I've known some professional sports people as well. Sometimes talent just isn't enough. Um, the real differentiating factor is what goes on up here. It's that determination that, some, that you can't teach anybody. It's that hunger that in many cases actually with artists is born out of adversity at some point in their, in their lives. Um, but, I, but, I, but I think having that, having that broader, more holistic 
understanding of what it takes to be a successful artist and therefore the psychological processes of what artists are going through. Uh, and then being able to apply that to giving them more holistic advice, which which goes all the way from the kind of psychology of what they're doing through to the very hard-nosed business decisions that they make has enabled me to build my legal practice very quickly. Yeah, can you agree uh, with the statement of my friend who she's a lawyer for entertainment here? So she always tell everybody that there is no artist like with a big experience in the music business that uh, had no bad deals. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, I, I mean, the good thing about um, my legal practice is I, I, I look after some artists who've been around for years and years and years, and they definitely will have had some bad deals. But I also look after some artists who I've been working with since day one and have just and have watched them grow. And in those circumstances, many of them won't have signed bad deals because I'm absolutely um, the, the, the problem with many artists is they, they sign these little contracts with small one man, one woman band um, labels early in their careers that sometimes can be very bad. But um, with my clients, I will look at those very short and easy contracts for nothing. I'll say, send them to me. Let's see what your obligations are and, and, and push back on those. So I think that as long as you can, as a lawyer, as long as you can get the trust of a, of a client early in their career and they understand that, that they're not fearful of phoning you up and thinking that you're looking at the clock every second you're speaking to them, which I just am not, then you can actually have a relationship with them where maybe, just maybe, they never sign a really bad deal. But of course, a lot of um, dealing with artists for me is rescuing artists who have signed bad deals, telling them what their options are, um, looking through those deals very carefully, seeing if there's a way out of those deals. If there's not an immediate and an obvious um, way out of those deals, it's playing the kind of the litigation game, which is a bit of a gamble. It's you know you writing nasty letters, um, going through the court process, and seeing if you can get to a yeah. position where you can get the parties to agree to a, to a sensible solution. Yeah, so uh, when the artist started their career uh, and he thinks that he needs a music lawyer, what, uh, what to, like, to pay attention for, how, how to pick a right lawyer, how to pick uh, a good lawyer, not a bad lawyer, what can be the advices for them? Well, I think you've got to you've got to rely on your gut up to a, up to a point. You've got to understand because it's a relationship that um, the one thing that your lawyer is going to give you, as long as you've got a lawyer who's pre prepared to give you time, who's available, who you're not waiting on for weeks on end, which uh, unfortunately certain people out there um, are associate are associated with that degree of service. But provided you've got somebody who's immediately available to you, it's just whether you feel a sense of warmth. You look at the you, clearly you want somebody with enough experience. Um, enough years under their belt to have encountered lots of different situations. Um, if you can find somebody who's got experience in dealing with the particular businesses that you're likely to be contracting with, even better, because then they, that lawyer will know the parameters of the deals available and won't be unrealistic. Um, there is a, di a completely different business model when it comes to European lawyers and US-based um, music lawyers. US-based music lawyers operate on a largely, not wholly, operate on a 5% basis. They charge 5% of the value of the deals they procure. Um, here in the, in certainly in the UK, we don't do that. We, um, where we can, we charge a fixed fee. We say, this is what's going to cost you. Um, where something's a bit more um, difficult to predict, like litigation, where people are scra squabbling with one another and you don't know whether they're going to stop squabbling in a week or in a month or in a year, that's a bit harder to predict. But we you know, the, the side of law that I'm involved in is all about certainty. Um, and I think, I, t I tell you what, for, for me and my experience, I know, I, if, if you want to make the real money, don't get me wrong, I run a successful legal practice, but if you want to make the real money as a lawyer, you go out and buy and sell very large companies. You do what's called m and in English, M&A um, rather, mergers and acquisitions. Um, music law is a slightly less... Um, it's less well paid. I mean, most people would describe what we do as relatively well paid, but it's not the it's not where the big money is. So you so you need to be somebody who who cares, who who's in it for the love. And most certainly in my firm, where there's a bunch of different lawyers, everybody is a massive music fan. There's nobody who's there's nobody who's in it just for kind of um, being for being a lawyer's sake. You've really got to buy into what it is that you're 
your clients are doing. You've got to feel the love. You've got to feel the vibe. Yeah, true. Uh, does an artist need a lawyer when he signs something in the music business? Because I know many artists know that the lawyer is expensive and they don't want to spend the money on a good lawyer. I think that happens a lot. I, I can only speak for myself. If, if an artist comes to me and um, says, I've been given this contract, I will say, send it to me. Uh, and, I will, and I will tell them without charge what it needs. If they, they, they then have the choice, I will then tell them what it's going to cost them. And if it's a new young client, I'll try and be as sensible as possible. And then they've got the choice. They know, they, they know it's cost them no money to know that they've got a contract that needs some work. Then it's for them to go away and decide. And occasionally people just say, um, no, I, I haven't got the money. I don't want to do this. But for the most part, if you're sensible with people, you don't quote them outrageous prices and you point out why it is that your services are required, generally speaking, you get the gig, especially in my case where I'm very open with people. There's no, I'm, the last thing I want is anybody to have any nasty surprises financially because um, the thing about music law is, you know, if you work in a good comparison, because I did some experience in film and TV, the other side of um, the entertainment legal spectrum, and there, but businesses within film and TV know that they've got to pay lawyers. It's, you know, it's on the line. You pay the accountant, you pay the, the actors, you pay the lawyers. It's one of those lines. Whereas in the music business, regrettably, um, artists are like, well, yeah, we've got to pay some studio time. Yeah, we might need to get a musician in, or if it's just that type of record, we might need to get a remixer or get a vocalist. But they, the one thing they do not want to do is pay for a lawyer. They treat it as a kind of... Um, they, they almost resent the, ex the, the expense. Um, so for that reason, one needs to be sensible with price. One needs to be transparent and there needs to be no nasty surprises. Uh, so you have experience already in a uh, lawyer. Uh, what can be the common mistakes for an entertainment lawyer? Like for people who are just starting their careers, what can you advise for them? Well, the common mistakes, I mean... <sighs> The thing about the thing about the, the music business, and it, and it applies to any sp um, sphere of entertainment, is there's a lot of commercial. You can be as trained up as a lawyer, you can understand what a contract means, but there are, it's almost more important to have commercial experience and understand the way the deals work. So, so <coughs> excuse me. Arguably, the most complicated of all is a music publishing agreement because there's many there are many bits in there that make no apparent sense that have almost evolved over time. The different parts of the deal and the different parts of the contract have evolved over time without any obvious logical common thread thread going through them. But they've they've evolved because a lawyer over, over the years has managed to evolve, uh, negotiate this um, positive point for the writer there, this positive point for the writer here. So if you don't, you really need to go into it with an understanding of the deals and the way the business works, because there's a lot of complexity in there. Um, there's not there's not any ironically, if I would say that the record deals, which is what you would think the music business is most about, I think they're the most simple of all of them, actually, because um, what are you doing? You're, you're basically looking at two things. You're looking at, or three, let's say three things. You're looking at buying, you're selling a track, selling rights in a track. You're looking at, so you're looking at the rights. You're looking at money, how the money flows in royalties. And you're looking at personal exclusivity, possibly, as far as the artist is concerned. Music publishing or management are a lot, lot, even though the, the agreements superficially might look um, as easy to get your head around, they're actually a lot more complicated um, because man music management actually, I think, is particularly complicated because there are many things that you would only realise if you read a management agreement if you actually been managed before. Um, for example, what happens if your manager just doesn't give you enough hours? What happens if your management company... Uh, the, the company managing you gets sold to a third party and potentially the person who's been managing you up to that point is no longer available to you. Um, how long is it reasonable for your manager to manage you for? How, do, how does one apply the fact that many artists now self-release records via lab, so-called label services deals? How does that impact on management when typically management managers were never expected to run their artist labels? How, what's the impact of that? Should the manager own their any IP, intellectual property in the recordings, and or should the manager receive extra um, commission for doing something that was never traditionally the domain of a manager? So there's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a complex issue, even though the contracts aren't necessarily as long as the 
um, as a recording contract might be. So, you know, understanding the market and understanding the issues would be what a young lawyer would struggle with more. I don't think the contracts themselves are necessarily that difficult to get your head around. Okay. Uh, what can be the common mistakes for the artist when they sign a record deal, for example, with a major label? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think the principles of signing to a major label are no different from the principles of signing to a small label, and the mistakes are no different. Um, obviously, if you were signing to a major label and you weren't getting a decent advance compared to a smaller label, that would be a problem. Well, what I mean, key, is, key issues would be rights period. How long are you signing your track for? Are you signing it in perpetuity, whereby it's with the um, with the label for life, for life of copyright, which isn't ideal. You'd rather sign it for a shorter time and get your rights back at some future date. Um, how exclusive is it? Do you Are you not able to do anything for any other label during the, the so-called term of the contract? Um, how... Um, what are your what are your obligations? Are, is the record company what's the record company paying for? Assuming you're getting an advance, what are they paying for over and above the advance? Are they paying for studio time? Are they paying for third party remixes? What is also what is recoupable against you? Is it just um, you get paid in advance, you get a royalty, and the that royalty chips away at your advance until suddenly you're owed, you're owed money by your record company? Or are there other things within that contract that are recoupable as well, which they typically are, um, such as videos, maybe third party marketing expenses um, and a few other things. So, I mean, I guess those are the key issues. But fundamentally, it's about following the rights, i.e. the rights in the in the recordings, following the money, i.e. How, how the money is transferred, how the calculation of royalties works and what wording goes around that and following the exclusivity, i.e. what um, metaphorical handcuffs is are being put on the artist. Can you tell, like, from a personal side, is the record deal with a major label is fair for artists? For everything, everything is relative. I mean, I think if you were signing to a major label and you were, um, and they were the only label that w were offering you a deal, uh, one thing might seem fair. Whereas if you had I mean, there are, there are effectively two major, three major labels. There's Warner Music, there's Sony Music, and there's Universal, and BMG as sort of a quasi-major. If you had any two of those or more equally all trying to sign you, then you can, I wouldn't say name your price, but it makes your uh, marketability and the, the value that you can sell the deal for much more significant. If they are, on the other hand, there is only one major label at the table, then the power is in their hands. So it's very difficult to talk about whether... Uh, a major record, major label record deal is equitable um, per se because it depends on what uh, it depends on all the variable factors that I just mentioned before. Yeah, but uh, this goes to the thing that I wanted to discuss with you. I think you saw that Kanye West started in Twitter saying that every artist should be free and uh, have their own masters, and all the label deals should be redone in the new way. So, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's very easy for somebody as successful as, as Kanye West to make that point. But um, one thing that you know, when label when major labels get it right, um, they have they are the capability to break artists who might not have broken any other way. Now, in the last five to ten years, we've had the emergence of so-called label services deals, which are effectively distribution deals, which flip the royalties that one would normally receive as an artist on their head. So. If you're signed to a major label, you typically be on a royalty on or around 20%. So 20p in the pound, 20 cents in the dollar, etc. Maybe a little bit better, but for ease of explanation, let's call let's call it that. Um, if you're assigned to a distribution of a, a label services agreement, um, many and many of those label services businesses are actually owned by the majors, it will be the other way around. You would likely be on around 80%. And the distribu distribution company would be on 20%. The difference is that those um, label services companies don't have the in-house promo function. They don't have that full infrastructure that's built up to break artists from the ground up. Because in the Spotify era, there's, depending on who you believe, anywhere between sort of 20 and 100,000 releases globally a week. So the battle to get your head above the parapet, get noticed, and create a career that exists beyond the level it does when you first start, which, let's face it, for most artists, when they first start, they're 
their fan base is their friends really and your <clears throat> and the aspiration is to keep growing a bit like peeling an onion you keep growing or reverse peeling an onion you keep growing your fan base in a broader and broader um geographical um spectrum until hopefully the world is your market um the theory is that a major label can do that better for you than you'd be able to do that for yourself or indeed the label services model will do it for you so i tend not to adopt this very sort of binary polar opinion about what record what major record labels do um that you, you can read plenty of negative stuff about them but actually as a way of breaking yourself out of your you know metaphorical bedroom as an artist or out of a smaller of fan base and into a much broader world. I don't think there's a better option. Well, yeah, this could be true also. Uh, can you tell, should an artist trademark his nickname or his band name, and what can be the problems if he doesn't do that? Um, actually, this week alone, I've had two, um, I've had two issues with names in relation to, <laughs> to acts. Um, the but the, uh, in, interestingly, again, one of the one of the downsides of their of Spotify and there being so many acts is it's just so much more difficult to create an original artist name that doesn't exist already. Uh, and the difficulty I have to give the English law position here because this the the legal position might be different in other parts of the world, but certainly as far as the UK is concerned, where we're talking artists who haven't registered. Um, trademark their names and it's very difficult it's expensive to trademark your name um, complicated complicated because it exists in a, in a number of different um, trademarking exists in a number of different categories of goods and services also trademarks exist um, in different regions so you could in the when before the the UK, for example, left the EU, regrettably, from my perspective, but that's another story. Um, you could get an EU-wide trademark, including the UK. Then you would need to probably trademark in the US. Um, now, none of, if you add all that stuff together, it's very expensive to do. You've also got to be sure that there's nobody else out there who's already sitting on your name. It's a, it's a complicated area of law that co could be done by individuals, but um, can't necessarily done, can't be done that easily. What can be done, of course, is sensible due diligence, where um, where you look on the um, you look online, you you go onto Spotify, you go onto Google, and you look really hard to see not just is your if your name has been used by somebody. You know, say you're you know if you're called John Smith, Google John Smith music and see what happens. But don't think that because you spelt your name J O N Smith and not J O H N Smith and somebody else has spelled it a different way, that that doesn't give them a right over your name. Um, so that's what's called an unregistered right, naming right or trademark right. And in this country, if there's an, a materially similar music act with the same name as yours, then uh, whilst they might have a few hoops to jump through legally, they could basically, effectively, the first strike wins. They were there first, they got to the name first, as far as they're concerned, you're a squatter. And their position becomes significantly stronger and easier to enforce if they've got a trademark. <coughs> nice. Um, if an artist was presented a management contract, what he needs to look for? Well, a management agreement um, it, it will really depend on the, the um, level of risk that the artist that the manager is taking if it's a completely fresh artist with little track record and just a lot of belief on the part of the manager then you may well get quite a long period of exclusivity so the first question to ask is what is the management term what is the period of exclusive exclusive representation by that manager of the artist um every every agreement needs to be judged on its own merits and, and judged on a case-by-case -case basis um the less chance the manager is taking, so if the manager is taking over management of a pre-existing act that's already got gigs, already got record sales, already got income, then it's reasonable that the manager is on a shorter minimum term because um, whereas if they're taking a huge amount of chance, they are sort of slinging mud at the wall as some managers do and seeing what sticks, um, maybe signing two or three or four artists and hoping that one of them will go on to have a huge career, then it's more reasonable that the manager has a longer period of time um the, the other the other key thing in relation to management agreements is what is how management commission is calculated in certainly in most of europe it's calculated on what's called a net basis meaning that you can deduct costs and then the manager charges his 20 percent on that 
Um, in cer certain managers, particularly in the US, insist upon doing it on gross. So they, they charge 20% on income without deduction of any cost. Now, that can make an enormous difference to the amount of money that the manager is receiving, especially on live income. You know, if you are a global traveling artist, your, your travel costs are likely to be substantial. Your, depending on the way that your um, fees are structured, you're also likely to be suffering withholding tax because a lot of countries impl uh, apply withholding tax to touring income. Uh, meaning they, that that country, the, the country where you're playing, it happens in the US, for example, happens in Spain, they deduct tax from your income before you even receive it as you're an artist when you do a live performance. Um, so if your manager is uh, commissioning you on gross, i.e. pretending that deduction never happened, then they're going to be getting way more than 20%. So, so the way that, so, so those are two key issues in relation to management, how long the gap, the, the term is, um, and how commission is calculated. I mean, but, m but most importantly, a lot of people see, or many many starting artists see management as a um, the holy grail. You know, once I've got a manager, the doors to the pearly gates are opening and we're entering a new kingdom of, of career. But it's really important to understand there's a lot of chances out there in the in the sort of management world. And I, uh, I represent many managers actually who are really good, but there are plenty of people who just, think that they, you know, I know one or two people, I could be a music manager. So you've got to take, you've got to think very carefully about whether the fit is right. And just because the person um, knocks, a manager knocks on your door as an artist uh, for, for the first time does not necessarily mean that they're going to be the best person to do the job. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I al always tell people that the manager won't do uh, dirty work for you. You just uh, you just start to do like, everything from the scratch. And then if you have a massive success, then you need a manager, not like in the beginning. So he will just make a promo for you, uh, make a playlist for you and so on and so forth. Like everyone, everyone wants that, but like that doesn't happen. No, you've got to, um, you've got to, it's no substitute for hunger. As an artist, you know, the one attribute you have to have over and above talent, I've got to say is hunger. And that hunger should never result in you thinking, I've got a manager, I'm going to palm loads of stuff on, onto the manager. You've still got to be, I think the most successful artists are not just good at making tracks, they've got a very solid business head on them. Uh, and I have many clients, and one of the great advantages of being a specialist lawyer with lots and lots of successful clients is you get, if you like, a view from the mountaintop at the way that, it, you know, a private glimpse into the, the private lives and the financial affairs and the business affairs of many successful people in the music business and almost all of them are switched on business wise it's a really really important attribute you can't just be somebody who makes fantastic art you've got to be switched on because we live in in, in a world of diy culture um, all the great artists you know not just in music but a lot of people in film even have started out on a diy basis they've created the marketplace for themselves and then other people have come in and helped them on their journey yeah absolutely agree with you. uh so if an artist for example uh also a writer uh, and he co-writes with others should they write an agreement before the session started it's very different, uh, difficult. It's a difficult question to answer because I've made, I've been in many, 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 many sessions where I've not done that myself. But at the same time, it's a valuable thing to do. But it, it's difficult. You, you, it, it maybe would spoil the vibe if you're doing it there and then. And clearly, you can't decide on what the songwriting share is until you've actually written the song and you know what the genuine, fair apportionment apportionment is between the different writers. But I wouldn't hang around after after the session. And if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, it's a conversation that should take place between managers. Yeah, because uh, when I was told, uh, I never make a session like in the States or in other countries, but as I was told, like uh, whenever like two songwriters, three songwriters uh, in the room, they all split like equally. That happens, but it's not, it's not, necessarily the way that it's always done well okay what's the difference between copywriting a song in a song versus copywriting in a recording 
Well, they're, quite simply, they're two different copyrights altogether. I mean, if you look at the Copyright Act of international treaties and the Copyright Act, certainly in my jurisdiction, which is the UK, um, and you read the relevant Act of Parliament, as far as the UK is concerned, a recording will be down there, and it's called the CDPA, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, is our Act of Parliament we have here, and the US will have an equivalent, it's in federal law, and they will list all the, all the different categories of copyright, and a recording will be one, and a song will be the other. Okay. Uh, can you tell, like, for upcoming artists uh, that they don't have, like, so much big experience in the music business, what, what is the music publishing and how do they make uh, money from that publishing with their music? Well, music publishing is the right of income for songwriters. So um, a, a good way of distinguishing between recordings income that we've already talked about and publishing income is if, if you, you could be a songwriter who never releases a record of your own, you just write songs for other people, or you could be a recording artist that writes their own songs uh, and gets the income from writing those songs, or you could be a recording artist that just uh, records other people's songs and cover versions, and in which case you would get no income from writing the song. So what music publishers do is that they, they collect um, and try and exploit the songs that exist um, that, that, that songwriters have written. So <laughs> the blipping again in the background. Um, they, um, there are rights, so-called rights societies here in the UK um, collecting. There are two income streams from songs. Or in fact, let's say there are three income streams and songs. There are there is mechanical um, income. So every time a track is streamed, every time a CD is pressed, there is so-called a mechanical royalty payable in relation to every song that is attached to that. There is then public performance income, which is paid um, out um, by societies that collect income just in relation to that. Um, that they pay. In, when, when music is played on the radio, when it's played in clubs, played at festivals, played in pubs, etc. Um, so, uh, and then there is bespoke use of songs, which will be synced. So the use of your song on film and TV, um, or maybe in games, um, it's, or maybe in apps. It's the, the use of music with moving images. So those are the three principal income streams. There's a fourth income stream, which is sheet music, which is where... Um, Songs are kind of written out in score fashion to be used often at schools and colleges, but sometimes for orchestra, orchestras to play. But when, in my area of law, that's not a very commonplace um, income stream. So what your music publisher does is collects all those um, areas of music and tries to go away and proactively um, create opportunities for the writer. Whether those opportunities are the sinks that I've talked about before, saying, you know, he, um, having connections with film and TV producers saying, I've got these great tracks I'd like you to use, um, or whether it's um, leveraging kind of co-writes and writing camps between different writers, where they encourage different writers who otherwise might necessarily not have met to, to write songs together, to bounce ideas, to kind of see what happens, you know, throw some mud at the wall and see what sticks. What agreements usually do sign artists with a producer? Um, well, I mean, most, most of the sort of artists who use a producer, which are mainly pop artists and sort of band style artists, um, will normally, um, yeah, the producer will take a share of the artist's royalty. So if the artist is on 20%, typically with a major label, producer might be on between three and 5% out of that 20%. So that leaves the artist, once the producer royalty has been deducted with 17 to 15 to 17%, um, the producer would normally be paid in advance. Um, depending on what the producer's um, contribution to the work was, the producer might get a share in the songwriting as well. Um, historically, producers didn't get that, but increasingly in the, in the modern music world, producers do because most producers play, most, mo most producers do have a, a musical contribution to the track. Yeah, you already, I think, a answered the question. My next question, what royalties can a producer have from the record? Okay, so uh, my followers' questions. Uh, Wentworth asks you, what's the best way to retain 
100% of a publishing as a songwriter writing for other pop artists. I would like to know what are the barriers to entry for people doing their own publishing instead of co-pubs. Why doesn't everyone do this if they have an artist management context already? What does this setup look like? Well, you don't, as a writer, if you're capable of generating work for yourself, you're well enough connected, you don't have to be published by a music publisher. Maybe I should have made that point before. You can simply rely on rights societies to collect your income for you. Um, what a publisher purports to do is give you, maybe give you an advance. If you've, got, if you've got enough of a body of work that's generating income, then they will give you, potentially give you a, an advance against royalties. And secondly, they will... Um, hopefully use create opportunities for both your songs and for you that you wouldn't otherwise have but if you've got a perfectly good track record of doing that yourself then there's every argument in favor of not doing that and just going direct with the right societies or in fact going with one of the publishers out there uh, here in the uk there's a publisher called centric which offers an easy in easy out model where you're not going to get an advance you'll get relatively good splits and you can literally put your songs in and if you and you give them three months notice, you can take the songs out again, which is very different from the publishing models where the publishers have rights for a much, much longer period of time. Cool. Wentworth also asks you, if is there a good go-to book you recommend for music law? Um, Anne Harrison in English, Anne Harrison has written a book. Um, I would imagine it's called Music Law, but yeah, just look for Anne Harrison. Okay, uh, and a uh, couple more questions from him. Top three things you always go straight to change when you receive a pub agreement for a writer he's rapping. Publishing agreement. Yeah. Uh, rights period, um, splits, and mm, term, term duration. Okay, and the last question from him. What are the top three things you go straight to change in artist deal agreement? Um, probably the same things, really. Um, because it's about, the, um, it's about following the money and following the rights and the rights not being granted for too long. They're different rights and the money comes from a different place, but the principle is the same. Okay. Um, Paul Hidden Music asks you what to do in case somebody steals your musical work that isn't under copyright. Well, copyright um, here in well, most of Europe, but not in the US, um, exists automatically. We don't have a formal system of registration of copyrights, and many countries don't have a formal system of registration. So, provided you can substantiate your claim that you created the work first and that it's been copied, then you can either undertake a formal um, legal process against the perpetrator or you can go through the kind of takedown procedures on all the key portals, Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, um, Facebook. Under law, all of those um, platforms and more have to offer in their kind of pay, in the sort of inner pages that you don't see on the app on, immediately find, but you'll find them if you look at terms and conditions in the top right or left hand corner, you'll find a page which enab enables you to um, go about a takedown process to take down um, work that has copyright infringement on it. Um, those same pages also give the person who's been taken down the right to reply and the right to say, no, you're doing it wrong. But that will be my first um, line of action. And the reason it's best to do that first is because it doesn't cost you anything in lawyers' fees to do it that way. Okay. NDOT Hip Hop asks you, what is the law around licensing specifically if I lease a beat, but someone else buys an exclusive license of the beat later, do I have to delete my song? It depends on what the contract says. I mean, I've not, I've, I've never quite got my head around leasing of beats because um, it doesn't make, if, if a lease means that you're only leasing it for a certain period of time, then how on earth can you license your track out to anybody? You've got to have, if somebody gives you a backing track, you've got to have rights forever. Otherwise, it really limits your opportunities to exploit that. You know, say you've created a, a hip hop track and you've leased the beat for five years and a big movie producer comes along and says, I want your song, your track to be in my movie. Then you're screwed because you can't license it to them because you've only got the rights for five years. 
Um, so the whole notion of leasing beats has always been something I've, that's been a bit strange to me. And I'm out, I represent some beat creators. I re represent some sort of hip hop artists, some grime artists here in the UK as well. But you cannot be leasing beats if you seriously want to your career to prosper long term. Okay. Uh, Anton De Don asks you, what are red flags artists should look out uh, in signing contracts on a small label owner? What's the most realistic way to write up a contract to protect yourself from losing your artist to a major la record label? Um, well, I don't know if that's one or two questions. Um, the, the contract to avoid losing your artist to a major label, um, well, that, that's... There's not really a one size fits all answer to that. You, um, it, you, you, you're not going to be able to sign an artist forever. Um, certainly in this country, if you, the longer the contract you um, sign with your artist, if you're a small label, um, the more unenforceable it becomes if that artist hasn't been legally represented. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that's the legal position everywhere in the world, but that's certainly the legal position here in the UK. So. Um, the answer, I suppose, if you want to keep your artist from being signed to a major label is sign them to a very long deal. But if that very long deal is unreasonable and they haven't been legally represented, then they might be able to get out of it anyway. Okay. Uh, the Real Cloud Phoenix asks you, how do I know if my distributor isn't giving me the correct amount of royalties sales income? You have a right of audit almost all um, royalty-based agreements provide for a right of audit, a right to inspect the records, the books and records, the accountancy books of the person doing the paying. And that really is your only um, your only redress under those circumstances. But, uh, but also use some common sense. Don't go with a complete unknown distributor because the established players are far less likely to mess you around. Okay. And Greg7 asks you need to learn more about copyright. Do you have something to add to what you said before about copyright or? I think it's difficult because because copyright is a, I would need a whole podcast to talk about copyright. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think I, for, for the purposes of the way that people understand copyright, who are music makers. I think people generally understand enough about it and understand enough about what an infringement is and what people can do. You know, there are, there are a few myths about copyright, for example, that you can, as long as you can sample somebody, as long as you only sample a little bit, for example, is a myth. That's simply not true. Um, but generally speaking, I think the level of knowledge of what copyright is and the, the do's and don'ts is um, sufficient to be able to, uh, for the purposes of now, Okay, cool. Blitz poll, you should answer quickly, but not necessarily monosyllabically, okay? Uh, three artists that you ever dreamed to work with. Um, well, I think they're all dead, but James Brown, Prince, and Jimi Hendrix. Okay, three modern artists that you like now. Oh, uh, cinematic Orchestra. Um, Tyler the Creator um, and Rex Orange County Okay, three things that you love about music business It's, it's got a real cross-section of society um, from all backgrounds it's not a um, every, you know, everybody everybody is doing it from a true perspective of passion and music itself is the most unique art form because it's the only art form you can set your life's memories to and three things that you want to change in music business um more female representation more black and ethnic minority representation at the lead in the leading kind of uh, managerial positions and um, never, and, and those that get so involved in the conveyor belt of the music industry that they forget why they're in it for the first, in the first instance. Okay, the most important song for you? 
Um, it's just too, it's just too, too many. Uh, Joni Mitchell, Big Yellow Taxi. Okay. If you would go to inhabit an island for a week, which three music albums do you pick? Uh, the Clash, London Calling, Street Sounds Electro, one, and uh, Café Del Mar, Volume Eight. Okay, cool. Uh, the contest. We have the contest. Uh, what could be the prize? Uh, free. Uh, I'll, I'll get on the get on the call to somebody and give them a completely free consultation. Makes it sound really. Uh, stiff but no have a have a have a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody about their career and give them a real surgery about their career yeah but now we should figure out what can be the terms to write something in the youtube comments uh what do you what do you want to see there you have something what do you want to see from the artist like because you won't be the choosing one uh, i want i want a real reason why you think you your artistic career is going to succeed over and above the hundreds of thousands of others who are out there trying to do the same thing. And that sounds a bit harsh, but you've got to have absolute determination and knowledge and belief in yourself. So that's actually very important. And I suppose the only unfair thing about that is that it's, you might have all of those but not be brilliant at writing, but you know, you've got to express it some sort of way. Hi, it's cool. So the term is to write, to write down any comments on a YouTube section why your career is important for you and why, why you, you are, are why important. Why you prosper over and above the tens of thousands of others who are thinking exactly the same thought. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jules, for your time. I appreciate it. This was very helpful. I think uh, this will be very valuable for all the community. And your accent, I love English accent, like way, 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 very much. It was a pleasure to listening to it through the whole almost an hour. Yeah. Thank you very much. If you watch this video till the end, you can like, you can share, you can comment. And of course, I will see you in the next episode. And by the way, if you don't understand anything about music business, put it in the comments so I can make the next episodes of music business in details about your topic.